Hey there, and welcome to Cyberpunk Librarian. I'm Daniel Messer. I don't really do New Year's resolutions for many of the same reasons I don't wish upon stars, because of my background in astronomy. Wait, no, that that didn't come out right, sorry. I don't make New Year's resolutions because the New Year, while a special event, isn't really a reason to think about making yourself better. I try and improve myself a little bit every day, whether it's something I learned, or a new thing I tried, or an affirmation of an idea, or whatever. The annual rolling round of January 1st, it just doesn't figure into it that much at all. With that in mind, it may sound weird that I'm doing a show that's essentially about New Year's resolutions. Thing is, that's just what most people call them. After all, when you give an episode a title, you need to make it sound familiar. Besides, I think it's a better title than, say, Continual Self-Improvement, which sounds like something you're forced to take every so often to keep your job. The fact is, the new year is here, and yes, I'm looking over some goals for the year. And that's the thing, you see. They're goals, and goals should be measurable in some form. Mine are typically measured using the old did I or didn't I metric. So why bother? Why share resolutions and goals with others? Well, in this case, uh, many of the things that I've got on tap apply to library work, and maybe you'll get some ideas of your own. Here's hoping. Or maybe you look at your own goals and wonder if there's something that could be optimized or changed. Maybe you challenge yourself. Maybe you push yourself just a little bit further because you listen to a nerd on the other side of the podcast. I hope so, because improving your skills and knowledge, it isn't just a professional or a librarian thing. It's a human thing. This is Cyberpunk Librarian, episode 41, So Be It Resolved. My name is Daniel Messer, your friendly neighborhood cyberpunk librarian, welcoming you back to the show that explores the intersection of libraries and technology and is all about living that high-tech, low-budget lifestyle. Hello, hey, and how the heck are you? Cyberpunk Librarian is back on the air and back on the fiber, returning to the net with the library tech goodness and the cyberpunk undertones. I hope you had a great holiday season and, you know, hopefully got a little time off with your friends and family. You had some downtime to rest and recoup and consider the previous year and kind of figure out what you got going for the new year and all of that stuff. But hey, I welcome you back to the show. It's great to be back in front of the microphone again. But before we get started, I have a couple of announcements to make, so if you'll bear with me for just a few minutes, I'll make this as quick as I can, okay? So, first up, there's another librarian podcaster out there named Steve Thomas, and he's the force behind this this amazing podcast called Circulating Ideas. Now, if you like libraries and you like interviews and podcasts, Well, then you seriously need to check this thing out, Chummers, because he does a show that I couldn't ever do because I'm a horrible interviewer. I'm only slightly worse as an interviewer than I am as an interviewee. Beyond the sweet cast, uh, Steve recently wrote an article for American Libraries Magazine about library podcasters. Now, you need to check this out because not only is Cyberpunk Librarian a feature of the article, but so are some other great library podcasts. I've got the link to it in the show notes at cyberpunklibrarian.com slash podcast. Go dig it up, and I want to send a big thanks and a shout out out to Steve for including me and the show in his article. That was really cool. He didn't have to do that. And I can't thank him enough for that. So if you're here because of American Libraries, hello, hi, and welcome to the show. 
And, you know, I hope you enjoy it. It's a little bit techy, a little bit nerdy, a little bit cyberpunk, but we try and keep things, you know, accessible for everyone. So, hello. And by the way, uh, Circulating uh, circulating Ideas has a Patreon campaign rolling on right now. So check out the podcast and show him some love and support on Patreon. He's worth it. The show is amazing, and it's totally worthy of your time and money. So check that out in the show notes, too. I've got links to both his show and to the Patreon campaign. So check that out and, you know, kick a little his way. It will really help. Another exciting development is that I'll be speaking at the 2016 Computers and Libraries Conference in Washington, D.C. I was absolutely amazed to find out that I'll be part of a panel uh, speaking on digital signage at the library. Now, if you happen to listen to the show, then you know I'm kind of into digital signage as a thing. So uh, if you if you happen to be heading to the conference, uh, March 8th through the 10th, 2016, in Washington, D.C., at the Washington Hilton, I hope to see you there. And, you know, hey, check out the other panels, too, because there's going to be some great speakers at CIL. It's always a really good conference. It's one of my favorites in the entire sort of library conference community. So, okay, okay, okay. That's the news. Here's the show. We're going to talk about some New Year's goals that I have. And, you know, my goals may not mesh with yours at all, or they might be spooky in their similarity. But the reason I want to put these out here is twofold. As I said before, I'm hoping they'll serve as a catalyst for some of my listeners. But there's also a selfish reason behind this. See, if I tell the world I'm going to do this stuff, well, I kind of have to do it. That's At least that's what I'm hoping for, you know? Now, I'm not only picking library and work-related subjects here, but there's going to be some personal goals as well. And throughout the year, as I accomplish some of these things, I'll try and keep you all updated. Some of these so-called resolutions, they're easier than others, uh, and some won't be complete by the end of the year, even if I do a stellar job. That's part of the improvement angle. It's sort of the whole, you know, the point of the journey being the journey and not the destination. But the takeaway is this. By the end of the year, I hope to have some brand new stuff that didn't exist at the beginning of the year, and I hope to be able to do some brand new things that I cannot do or at least cannot do very well, right now. So, let's get on that, shall we? started, let's look at the techie geeky stuff I have in my notebook, and then we'll move on to the more esoteric stuff of interest, or at least I hope it's somewhat interesting. So a few months back, I finally got some help at work. For those playing the home game, I'm a web content manager, which means I should be creating and populating content to the library's site. Okay, fine, that's cool, that's cool. Except I also needed to handle an intranet, some web development tasks, ILS issues, and so on and so forth. Six months ago, we hired a web developer and SQL expert lovingly referred to as HP. Now, HP doesn't stand for Hewlett-Packard, nor does it refer to any of the Lovecrafts. However, HP knows what the hell he's doing when it comes to web development. He's engineered a job-changing feature for me on the website that sets up our web slides in an easy-to-use, browser-administered, database-driven system. It's beautiful, and it inspired me to really double down on developing my, well, development skills. Now, we use the Polaris ILS, which is Microsoft-based all the way. The pack runs on an ASP.NET-based architecture, and so if I want to do something that makes my job easier, there's nothing better to start with than just really picking up my skills in ASP.NET uh, web development. Being able to create new and exciting things for the pack and have them easily used from a browser-based front end, that's amazing. That's awesome. That was literally game-changing. Now, there's no way... I'm going to get to his skill level anytime soon, if ever. But fostering my ability to contribute, well, 
that'd be a powerful change in my workflow and for the library's IT department. So to give a name to this goal, I'd like to just drastically and significantly increase my skills in ASP.NET Web Development by the end of the year. Not only is that a professional goal, but it's something I'd be able to use for projects at home and for side gigs here and there. Besides, learning something that makes my job easier, well, that kind of sounds like a no-brainer type of thing to me. Now, speaking of development, if you're going to learn one programming language, well, why not learn two? If you've listened to the show at all, uh, you know that I do a lot of work with Raspberry Pis and open source technology. There are some things I'd like to build upon with the Pi, not only in the arena of digital signage, which is a primary use for them now, but also application development for other uses. Now, the Pi is run on Linux, and Linux works with dozens of languages. So there's many to choose from, but I think my best bet, given my projects and ideas, would, to, would be to just pick up on some Python. Now, I know a bit of Python. I'm not totally ignorant of it, and I can kind of hack it, and I can look at it and figure out what it does. But I'm just not very good with the language overall. Some of the signage systems I'm interested in are Python-based, and Python seems to be a favored language for dealing with Arduinos, too, which is something else I have an interest in, but that's for another show. So on the tech side of things, and the more professionally based side, we're looking at learning something about development. As I've said before, computers are easier if you can tell them what to do, and you can make your job so much easier if only you can write a little code. So for instance, a while back, Polaris didn't print out slips for held materials. As it is now, when we get an item in that's on hold for someone that's picking it up at that branch, we check it in and the receipt printer spits out a receipt that's long enough to fit in the book and stick out and it's got the, you know, the last name and a first initial and stuff like that. It didn't do that at first. It wasn't something that Polaris had built into it when I first started with my current job at the library. Keep in mind, this was 10 years ago, so it's, it's been a fair amount of time. So instead, we wound up cutting slips of paper and then handwriting the patron's name on them. Now, I, uh, I know that doesn't sound like a whole lot to do, except I was working for a library that was doing anywhere from 800 to 1,000 holds per day. So you can, you can tell what kind of tedium this was. So I wrote a little app that fixed that. It was a bit hacky but it made life a lot easier for me and my staff. Now, at the time, I wrote that thing in Visual Basic, which I know enough about to get along, but once again, I'm not very fluent. And, you know, it, it really helped. We could just, you know, check in a thing, we could click a button, and the receipt would spit out a, you know, a pickup slip. It was great. And now Polaris has that built in, so we don't have to worry about it now. But even now, Polaris doesn't automatically handle adding an unclaimed fee to items that patrons request but don't pick up. Some libraries charge for that. If you put in a request and then you don't get it, well, that's time and money and staff time to put it back. So, no problem. I wrote a small app to handle that too. Once again, it's just a dumb little thing that makes life easier. And I'll drop a link to the code on GitHub if you're interested. As it is, I like to write a little code. And now I'd like to write a lot more. On a more personal level, well, the funny thing is that many of my personal projects occasionally tie to my professional work. Creativity is part of my job, which is good because creativity is part of my life. I mean, heck, you wouldn't be listening to this show if I didn't have a creative side to me. I've got notes and lists of ideas for projects that I want to work on at some point, and I'd like to make that point now for more than a few of them. So if you've listened to the show at all, you'd pick up that I'm kind of a fan of down-tempo and ambient music. I mean, just check the track before. 
As it happens, I'm not only a fan, but a creator. I've been a keyboardist since I was five years old, and I've done a few albums here and there. My most recent work is The View from Amalthea, but that was something I did quite a little while ago, actually. If you'd like to listen to it, I'll include links in the show notes at cyberpunklibrarian.com slash podcast so you can download the songs from SoundCloud or buy the album on Bandcamp. I've had some ideas for spacey, ambient tunes for a while now, and I've only begun the process of recording them. So one of my goals for this year is to record and release a new album. The View from Amalthea was space music with some New Age instrumental thrown in, but the space theme was definitely there. Without giving too much away, this next project will be more ambient in nature, which I know isn't for everyone. Explaining my love of ambient music is really a show in and of itself, but to make things simple, let me just explain that to me, ambient music is like a drug. And I mean that literally, because I can go someplace quiet, tuck myself away, and put on some headphones. I'll usually hit up the drone zone or mission control stations on Soma FM. And then I close my eyes. And I see things. It's not quite hallucinations, because they're totally within my mind. If I open my eyes, the visions aren't there. But that trip is just as real as anything else that might be drug-induced. So anyway, my love for this genre led me to wanting to create in that realm. So this year, y'all will be able to get a new album of ambient music from the depths of space. Now, it might be weird to try and tie that kind of thing to my professional work. How would space and ambient tunes fit in with the job of a web guy? Well, actually, that's pretty easy because sometimes I'm called upon to make multimedia content like a video or audio piece. And you know what? Sometimes those pieces need music. Now, I can look around for a song that's okay to use and is Creative Commons or Public Domain and all of that, and I've totally done that. But sometimes it just so happens that something I wrote is a pretty good backing piece for the tune. And all of my stuff is Creative Commons, and I'll happily donate them to my professional work. And finally, at least for this show, writing. I write, well, let's face it, I write quite a bit. I might even write a lot, I'm not sure. I don't know because I just kind of write as a thing that I do. I write a monthly tech column for the staff newsletter. I write nonfiction. I write flash fiction. I write short stories. I write blog posts and articles and podcasts. And you'd think with all of that, I'd be writing enough. And maybe I am. But what I desire is more focus. I've written two books. One is a popular history book called Hyperlinked History, A Multifaceted Journey Through Time, which is based on a show that I'm in the process of reviving. It's taking a little longer than I hoped, but it's still on the way. Another is a book called All My Rattling On, Essays, Musings, and Rants on Libraries, Technology, and Science. That's fine, but did you know I'm in the final stages of finishing up not one, but two more books? Final stages are kind of the keywords here, because I've been sitting on these things for a few months now. You want to know why? Because I procrastinated. I just haven't done it yet. The writing is done. I mean, it's all complete. I still need to edit and compile and actually render an ebook. And that, that takes a lot of time, but it doesn't, it doesn't take months. That delay has been purely my own, and I'm done with it. My next book will be a collection of essays on cyberpunk philosophy and culture. I hope to have it out and ready to roll by early February. The goal is to get it on Amazon and other, service, you know, other downloadable services by mid-February, which will at least give me leave to move on to the fourth book and finish compiling and editing that to get it out as well. So you could say that my goal here is just to simply finish what I've started. But going further, there are a few other projects that I need to finish, but I also need to start them. I really enjoy writing flash fiction. Part of this is just a time crunch thing. 
I've got a lot to do at work. I've got a lot to do at home. There's stuff that I like to do that, you know, is fun or useful or whatever. But writing flash fiction is nice because it's quick. It's simple. It's easy. You can, you know, just pick a topic, a picture, a photo, a whatever, and then write a short, you know, just write the shortest of short stories about it, maybe a page. And it kind of just fuels that creative urge that, you know, I can get something out that's new, something different, something that didn't exist, you know, maybe 30, 40 minutes ago. So I really enjoy writing it and I want to do more of that. It should be fairly easy, I would think, especially since I draw inspiration from a lot of sources. Heck, I have a folder filled with images that make me think of stories. I think it's time to actually do something with that. So I'll be sharing this stuff online, and I'll follow up with some linkage later this year as I get something online that's worth reading. Um, I've done a couple before. Let me dig them up, and I'll go ahead and link those in the show notes as well so you kind of get an idea. And as a teaser for the next show, I've got myself some new software for writing. You know, we're talking about writing, so let's let's talk about writing. Let's actually talk about some software. Um, but like I said, this is the next show, so I do apologize for the teaser. But you, I think you'll like this because it's amazing software, and it's amazing because it's highly text-based, but it's extensible. It's themable. And I've been writing for a long time, folks, and this is quite literally... Uh, I would say it's the best text editor I have ever used, at least so far. I mean, for all I know, next week something comes along and beats the pants off of it. But yeah, this this thing sort of came out of nowhere. It was recommended to me by a friend. And I think y'all are going to love it. And I can't wait to tell you about it next time here on Cyberpunk Librarian. But, um, well, you know, I uh, I got to write that show first. And that about wraps up another episode of Cyberpunk Librarian. I thank you for tuning in, for checking out the show. And like I said, if you're new here from American Libraries or otherwise, hello. I hope you enjoyed. I hope you'll come back for more. Cyberpunk Librarian has got a lot in store for 2016. And I hope you do too, now that you've you know listened to my resolutions or my goals. I hope you got some of your own. I hope you continue to improve. I hope you get better and better. And that's not just me doing like some Mr. Rogers thing. This is something that I truly believe in and you know hope you take with you. The tune you're digging on right now is called Starshine. Earlier in the show, you heard Echo Mirage and Star Drift. These are three tunes by yours truly, Daniel Messer. And I've got links to those in the show notes if you want to download them or listen to them on your own. These are from my, uh, well, two of them are from my last album. One is from an album before that. As always, the opening track is Belly Dance at Ibisu by Ryo Miyashita. Find a link to that in the show notes too at cyberpunklibrarian.com slash podcast. Cyberpunk Librarian is hosted by the Internet Archive at archive.org. Great people doing some great things, some really, really talented digital archivists there doing some extremely important work. And not only do they do that important work, they host shows like this and shows that are nothing like this at all. So go check them out, archive.org. Some great people doing some great stuff. Also, we are hosted on YouTube at youtube.com slash cyberpunklibrarian. So if, like the growing audience of people, you like to get your audio via video, well, hey, who am I to judge? So the uh, show usually goes live about the same time on YouTube as it does on the RSS feed. There can be a small delay as I have to flip some switches, but, you know, it, it's pretty quick to show up. So youtube.com slash cyberpunk librarian. And hey, watch some watch for some surprises on my YouTube channel as well, as I'm going to be making some more forays into video. 
If you'd like to contact me online or, you know, drop me a question or an idea for a show or just something you want me to talk about, whatever, I love to hear from my listeners. On Twitter, I am at Bibrarian. That's B-I-B-R-A-R-I-A-N. That's like librarian, but it starts with a B. You can also pick me up on Google Plus. I am Google.com slash plus Daniel Messer. Or if you want to use the old-fashioned SMTP method of contacting me, I'm cyberpunklibrarian at gmail.com. Drop me a line, drop a comment in the show notes. I love hearing from you, and I love your suggestions. You know, sometimes I've gotten suggestions from listeners that I didn't even think of for a show, and it turns out to be a really great idea for a show. So let me know, and, you know, if nothing else, just say hi. It gets lonely on this side of the mic sometimes. And with that, we're going to get out of here. I will see you again in approximately two weeks. I try and get these things out every two weeks. Sometimes I miss like I did this last time, but that was mostly due to the holidays and some craziness that just seems to happen with the holidays. I think that's all done. I think that's all died down. I think we're, I think we're off to a good start. So I will see you next time right here on Cyberpunk Librarian. But first, I got to tell you before we get out of here. But you don't have to be high-tech to be low-budget. It just certainly helps if you're a cyberpunk. Take care now. See you next time.